yeah, I guess not. Poor little guy. <laughs> it's like, you get my politician garb and everybody throws food at me. <laughs> Okay, we'll go ahead and call this meeting to order. Welcome to the second day of our last or almost last meeting of joint agriculture. Let's go ahead and call the roll. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. This is roll call for the joint ag committee for November 15th. Senator French. Senator Cole. Present. Senator Cost. Yeah. Senator Wasserberger. Representative Blackburn. 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 I'm yeah. not. Representative Clausen. Here. Representative Fortner. Representative Heiner. Here. Representative Larson. Representative Western. Here. Representative Worf. Here. Representative Winter. Here. Chairman Boner. Here. Co-Chairman Eklund. Here. All are present, Mr. Chairman. Okay, so uh, welcome to the second day. Like I said, I uh, got a uh, slightly shorter agenda uh, today with a tour, at, and we waited to the, there's snow falling for the tour of the state fairgrounds, so hope everybody's excited for that. Um, before we get going, uh, we have to resolve some uh, uh, business and just make sure we're all on the same track regarding the subpoena we issued. Now, Management Council policy uh, dictates that we have to uh, tell them what the nature of the investigation is. And so this is the, I uh, just want to run the language uh, by the committee, make sure we have it covered. And I'll just read it here. It says, nature of the investigation. To determine the process for relaying case files, evidence, testimony, and all other relevant information among decision makers throughout the state land agriculture and, agriculture and grazing leasing process, and the processes for determining and addressing conflict of interest along, among decision makers. The nature of the investigation includes decision making in the context of the Lehman Wagon Hound case regarding state lease number 1 8710. So, as long as that uh, embodies the intent of this committee, I think we're good to go. Just go along and, and send that. So, Absent any objection, well, that, that'll be the nature of the investigation. Does anybody have any input? Okay, very good. Thank you, Heather, and thank you, to the staff, for uh, for the late night last night, figuring out how to uh, uh, go through this process. I think a uh, committee, if nothing else, will uh, learn about a process that is not very uh, well utilized in the legislature, and uh, we'll, we'll learn together uh, what, what the results are. But at the end of the day, I think it's important that uh, when we ask an agency to be at our committee, that they show up. Um, in, in my mind, I had very simple questions about just what we read. Uh, how do you go through the process so we can make uh, whatever determinations we need to make in terms of the policy uh, as far how that process works? And we can't do that if we don't understand the process um, So in its entirety. So uh, that being said, we'll be in contact and see what Management Council uh, says. Well, our next step is to talk to them. Uh, but and we'll uh, relay any further information that we learn about this process as as we move through it. So uh, that being said, we're on to our 840 agenda item, talk about livestock definitions. So if LSO to come up to present this piece of legislation as a reminder, this is one of our um, one of our topics. Just uh, the, the, what I told uh, folks at the beginning of this uh, uh, topic was that you know there's lots of uh, I guess. Uh, less traditional types of agriculture out in the state. And, and we talk about, say, honeybees, for example, it's something that's important to have a healthy honeybee population. They've been struggling uh, and it's important to production agriculture as well. As a farmer, uh, you know, cross pollination is pretty important to me. And so anything we can do to incentivize some of these uh, uh, smaller um, uh, operations is, I think, important. And it's important to be consistent uh, when we talk about who qualifies for our uh, 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 tax break for uh, uh, agricultural use for uh, uh, property taxes. So with that, Ms. Jarvis, take it away. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Heather Jarvis with Wyoming Legislative Service Office. So the bill before you is 23 LSO-0199, working draft 0 0.2. And this bill, very short bill with specific purpose that it This bill clarifies that apiculture is 
an agricultural purpose for tax purposes. So in Title 39, um, specifically Chapter 13, which is the ad valorem taxation. Ad valorem taxes are the property tax based on the assessed value of the property. The, there's a, a def, this goes into the definition section, and it just it specifies that agricultural purpose uh, includes the land's capability to produce. And then you'll notice on page two at line 11, apiculture, which is the fancy word for bees. And um, in that, uh, the, it does refer to agricultural purpose as used in WS 39-13-103BX. Um, and that 103BX, uh, B10, sorry, <laughs> could translate the Roman numerals there, is it just simply is the specification of the imposition of the tax. And number uh, Roman numeral 10 uh, discusses agricultural land and it, and in the different uses of the land um, of, for the different parcels and how they are, it, it uh, talks about land for an, an agricultural purpose. So that's where this definition is plugged in. And that is the bill. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, straightforward bill, Representative Hire, you have a question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I know I should have looked this up myself, but, I, but uh, is there a minimum acreage to be classified as agricultural land or uh, so or is this such that someone with just one or two acres could could uh, try to get their land classified based on apiary mr chairman representative heiner there are some acreage requirements and they tend to make it just be so that um i need to look up specifically at your question about one or two acres and i because Honestly, I had all those acreage requirements in my head and should have brought back when I drafted the bill because I was lo looking to make sure that this would apply and that you didn't have to have thousands of acres to account for this and would how, how small or large would it apply. And so they they would, um, it it could be someone with, I, I believe someone with pretty small acreage. The, the acreage stuff is written in such a way um, I better I better just go double check and look it up, but that it wouldn't it wouldn't foreclose on some on a small operation of the uh, of ap of apiculture, um, but it also wouldn't would not um, well that that's it it wouldn't foreclose a small operation. But I need to find out what the small amount was, and I don't have it right here fresh in my head again still. Representative Fortner. Thank you. Uh, is there a dollar value on what you have to create here for this uh, ag use land to, to maintain maintain the use of it? Uh, at home, I know they've changed that. They've increased it quite a bit by people that didn't generate. I can't remember the amount of money, but anyways, uh, is that in this bill as well? Mr. Chairman, Representative Fortner, this that that one oh thirty nine dash thirteen dash one oh three B ten B set Roman numeral X is that is the uh, an entire section that talks that applies to agricultural land, and yes, there's a dollar amount, and actually that okay. This also answers the the thirty five acres section. Um, the, or or more or otherwise qualified. So this is the, there's the 35 acres is one of the um, it, the land can't be part of a platted subdivision except for a parcel of 35 acres or more, which otherwise qualifies for agricultural land. That answers goes back to your question, and then uh, Representative Fortner, there is also the gross revenues, but they're not. Um, I don't I don't know where these amounts came from. I didn't research the amounts, but. It talks about in this section, if the land is not leased land, the owner of the land has derived annual gross revenues of not less than $500 from the marketing of agricultural products and $1,000 from market. Um, oh, and if it's leased land, $1,000. So they are relatively low amounts um, in, in for this particular um, ad valorem assessment. I think that was a revenue committee bill uh, last session to raise the $500. I don't think it got too far. Um, so separate consideration in my mind, 
Um, we're, we're simply saying this, this type of agriculture is in fact agriculture, but yeah, it's important to have this discussion about what are the natural sideboards on this, you know, at this agricultural uh, classification, because I'm sure that's a question where we would get on the floor if this bill moves forward is that was it's just a way to get around property taxes. If you have two bees, is that enough? You sell one jar of honey? And, and the answer is no. There's, uh, in, in addition to the natural limitations, I'm pretty sure you can't own bees in town, for example. I'm guessing, I, I hope not. Uh, <laughs> there you go. Right, yeah. So, so there's that limitation. There's a 35 acre limitation. There's a requirement you sell at least $500 worth of product. So th those are all very important questions. A good questions committee. Okay, so any further questions, uh, Senator Cold? Thank you, Chairman. Uh, just a few things. So to be clear, I'm all for the bees. I, I think I think pollination is is uh, is what we we have to continue to do for for everything. I mean, it collapses. However, I am concerned that we're going to give people a way to decrease their property taxes by and, and tell me if i'm what i'm going to say is incorrect a, a scenario somebody goes off and buys thousand dollars worth of bee products takes said thousand dollars of bee products and then sells said thousand dollars of bee products under that scenario would they qualify under the 500 dollars of sales so you could even sell it at a loss say i bought a thousand dollars I sold it for six fifty or five hundred, whatever, to get my five hundred dollars worth of products I sold. Could you game the system in that manner and get the uh, lower rate for your property evaluation? Or, and if that's true, would you have any idea that a way to stop that from happening? Because I'm all for people having the ability to, to uh, you know, raise bees and you know, calling it an agricultural uh, activity. But I'm afraid that the, the negative impacts for revenue, pe people would game the system. I mean, folks, they, I mean, a little anecdotal, but they aren't stupid and they'll figure out a way around it. So I, I'd, I'd like to make sure or hear from you what your opinion is. Is, is this going to uh, be a potential possibility? Mr. Chairman, Senator Kolb, I, first of all, I think folks always find a way to game the system. However, this portion of the law is pretty tight already. And back to that, that X, that Roman numeral X, these are, you have to have all of these aspects to be, uh, to qualify. And let, let me just tell you about them. Um, the, for agricultural land, this shall apply contiguous or, or non-contiguous parcels of land under one operation owned or leased shall qualify for classification as agricultural land if the land meets each of the following qualifications. So they have to, I don't think that your specific scenario of the person going and buying it and selling it, because the first one is the land is presently being used and employed for an agricultural purpose, including use as a farm. Well, we, that doesn't apply here, but for an agricultural purpose. So here we just, this bill adds apiculture as one of the ag agricultural purposes, but it says, so the land has to be being used for that. And the land is not part of a platted subdivision, except for a parcel of 35 acres. There's that part. And if the land is not leased land, here's the 500 or thousand um the amount qualification and i'm not trying to gloss over it i just didn't know if you want me to read the verbatim but and the land has been used or employed consistent with the land size location and capability to produce as defined by department rules and the mapping and agricultural manual published by the department primarily in agricultural operation or the land does not meet this requirement and the requirement of subdivision three of this paragraph because, um, and then there's several reasons that it might um, be able to qualify out, but th that's even four of those. And so you have to have all of the requirements to meet it and they are using the land. I don't, so, so that scenario, I can't say every scenario where someone may game the system, but the one you described going and buying it and turning it around so they could get the discount, they wouldn't, right off the bat, it seems they would not qualify for several of these, which they have to have all of them to qualify. I didn't mean you weren't going to have bees on the property. I just meant you didn't have enough product produced and to quit the qualifications for the $500. You could, you could then resell products. There's no prohibition against that. And I, I know for actually 
from friends of mine that there's, uh, you know, some dealings with their neighbors about selling agricultural products and getting the exemption. So I was just concerned about that. So I guess last question would, I guess, to reiterate, uh, any, any, have we done any analysis on the potential negative impacts for states, for the state of Wyoming's revenue, if, if this has changed? Uh, and, and we include bees in the uh, use of agricultural property. Has anyone analyzed that? Mr. Chairman, Senator Kolb, that may be my opportunity to punt to another um, testifier here because I believe the, the Department of Revenue is here. Okay, any further questions, committee? Okay, thank you very much. Appreciate that. Okay, next up, we have Department of Revenue. Come on down. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Brian Judkins. I am the uh, administrator of the property tax division for the Department of Revenue. Um, I would like to clarify some questions that were just asked by a few of you. So uh, classifying, when the assessor classifies uh, a parcel of land for agriculture, that assessor has to determine what that land is used at its fullest capability. So when we're talking about bees, if we have a 200 acre parcel, are bees gonna be defined as using that 200 acres as its fullest capability. So think about how the, as the rules and statutes are written right now, let me give you a, an example that I've personally dealt with in Fremont County when I was uh, working for the assessor up there back in the day. Um, had a, uh, a rancher that had 2,500 acres and was running 25 head of cow on it or cattle on it. Is that land being used at its fullest capability? Probably not. So we can take that into perspective and um, just just remember that the land has to be used at its fullest capability. So when we're when we're looking at that, um, as was previously previously mentioned, uh, there are some monetary requirements. Five hundred dollars uh, has to be made if you are the or if you are the landowner and $1,000 uh, with the land being leased. Again, if you sell one cow off 1,000 acres, obviously you're gonna meet that requirement. But the second step is that land being used at its fullest capability. Um, back to size limits, uh, let me clarify that real quick. So the statute is, is clear on uh, subdivision or uh, platted land subdivided land that has to be a minimum of 35 acres. But as a property owner, if I own a section of land and I own two acres in a different area, and that's part of my ag uh, uh, operation, those two acres can qualify you or can be uh, valued for an agricultural operation. So the size limit is only in a platted subdivision. So if, if it's unplatted land, there's no uh, requirement. Because I could have a, you know, an acre of irrigated uh, hay pasture that I hay um, that's totally separate from my operation. And that would still be qualified as, as an agricultural uh, valuation. So we've done some research uh, looking at the uh, apicultural, did I say that right? Bees. <laughs> um, there are 21 states that classify uh, land as agricultural uh, with the use of bees. So that doesn't mean that it's being valued as uh, agricultural use, but they do consider uh, bees as livestock in 21 states. Um, Texas has some interesting uh, statutes that uh, require uh, uh, operate, uh, bee operators to, it's a minimum of five acres and a maximum of 10 acres. So if we kind of step back and think about agricultural land in Wyoming, 
the majority of larger parcels are already being valued as an agricultural use. Yes, those bees play a huge important part of the pollination of, of that land, but it's already being uh, valued as, as an agricultural um, operation. So if something to consider is, you know, one acre or uh, Senator Kolb had mentioned, you know, does that property owner, would they qualify one acre? So I think as, as the legislative body, I think it would be advisable to um, definitely look at a, uh, a size uh, qualification. Um, and again, uh, Texas is, is not less than five acres and no more than 10 acres to be uh, valued as a uh, uh, agricultural use for that land. Um, livestock is defined uh, in statute 3911-101-AX as horses, cattle, mules, asses, sheep, swine, goats, and all other animals commonly thought as livestock. So again, the, the, the statute, the bill is, is to put bees as an agricultural use, but we can uh, define bees as, as a, a livestock. But if we read that where it says swine, asses, goats, just because you have these forms of livestock doesn't mean that you are valued as an agricultural operation. Again, the, the, the land has to be used at its fullest capability. Um, so when we look, if we go down the road of, of classifying bees as an agricultural use, so right now the uh, um, rules and statute is for rangeland, it's uh, valued by how many AUMs that rangeland can support. And an AUM is a uh, animal unit month, and it's uh, the amount of forage required to maintain a thousand pound cow with or without calf for one month. So that's rangeland. That's how rangeland is valued in Wyoming. Uh, dry crop land is valued by wheat production, and irrigated land is valued by hay production. Uh, irrigated land, hay is the most prominent uh, crop for irrigated in Wyoming. So back in the day, uh, it was decided that uh, hay shall be used to value uh, irrigated land. So with that being said, it would probably be good to have some guidance on how uh, we would treat or how we would value uh, as smaller parcels of land that uh, would qualify for a uh, apicultural or agricultural use for bees. Um, that bees doesn't really fit in any three of those categories on how we're valuing right now. So that's uh, definitely something the department would, could uh, research uh, further and uh, try and determine how, how to value those parcels. But again, the majority of larger parcels in Wyoming are already valued at ag if they're using it as ag. Um, uh, I guess that's all I have. Uh, I'll stand for any questions. Okay. Thank you. And just so we understand, you know, some of the other elements here. Mm -hmm. If you have a house on agricultural land, you're still taxed at the residential rate for that house, correct? So the, the rancher's house was on their property. It's not like they they pay ag rates for their house, they're still paying residential rates, right? Senator Boner, that is correct. Okay. So okay. what we determine is what land supports that residential structure. Right. And that land is is valued as at full market value. Right. And so I just want to make sure everybody understands that's honest with everything. If you're in agriculture, yeah. you don't pay any taxes on your house. You still yeah. do. So the, it, the production of, of an agricultural product and the land that supports uh, farm buildings is is uh, valued at uh, uh, agricultural. Right. Yeah, and that makes sense. So it's just if you have a 40 acre plot, it's a question of whether that's going to be residential or agricultural. And I appreciate the input from Texas because that that strikes me as a, a, I don't know anything about app or about bees, but uh, seems to me five ten acres seems about right. But uh, <laughs> um, and maybe that 35 acre requirement for everything else may be a little onerous. So. 
Okay. Hey, okay. Committee, any questions from the Department of Revenue? Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, exemptions for caretaker housing on property. Is it, does that have anything to do with uh, the uh, ag situation and claiming that you have a caretaker's residence? Or is that only industrial? Commercial? I'm, I'm not familiar with an exemption on a caretaker for a ranch. Mm -hmm. No. Okay. Oh, no. well, thank you. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm thinking right now we should have should have brought maybe the only um, large beekeeper I know of in the state here to testify. We did this one time. Um, let me get this closer. We we worked on this idea of bringing bees into ag classification, and the the beekeepers that came to it really didn't want our help. <laughs> didn't think it would make a whole lot of difference. Um, you brought up some points. I'm I'm just not sure how this would affect some of them. I think the largest one that I know of in the state doesn't really even operate in the state. It all goes, he, he pollinates in California and other places where he's needed. And that's his greatest income. And I don't know how many acres he's got, whether he's just got a large size lot out it's kind of on the fringe of town that I know of. I've been there. Um, but I'm thinking before we put limits on acreage, we probably need to talk to these guys, see how it would affect them. Are you aware? My question for you is, are you aware of, of any examples of how this would affect our beekeepers? Has, has your department researched any of that? Mr. Chairman? We, we have not, no. Okay. Um, it's not your job, it's ours. <laughs> and, and <laughs> no, I, I can't I, say that. I it's, never it's... even thought to make a couple phone calls, see if some of them could come. Yeah. Um, so, okay. okay, thank you. Representative Fortner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Up in my neck of the woods, Campbell County, there's they've been subdividing ground for up there for 50 years. And a lot of it is in 40 acre increments. And they was all sold at the time, 40 or 50 years ago, that that would never go up as, as um, subdivision type land where they could assess it higher. It was all sold as uh, ag ground. That's the way it was sold and that's that's how they've been paying on it. So with that being said, Will these guys get grandfathered in or now are they going to get assessed at a new rate? Mr. Chairman, if I may, uh, Representative Fortner, again, let's step back. Let's look at law. That land has to produce an agricultural product for it to be taxed as, as an agricultural value. So if, if it's no longer being used at egg, it shouldn't be valued as egg. Okay, any further questions? All right, thank you for your input. Okay, is there any public comment on this issue? Mr. Moline, come on down. Good to see your smiling face this morning. <laughs> Pardon me, sir. Bzz. That's a busy topic, isn't it? I guess uh, Brett Moline, Wyoming Farm Bureau Federation, uh, looking at what this bill does, it's actually, it's pretty simple. It just classifies in Wyoming that bees are considered livestock. The USDA considers bees livestock. Uh, the other safeguards that we have within our law, as was described earlier, it has to be a certain size of parcel of land. You have to have so many dollars worth of production. And the land, the big one is the land has to be used to its capabilities. So as was mentioned, you know, somebody with 5,000 acres run, running one B is probably not gonna qualify. With the other safeguards in there, with the, uh, the way this bill's written, I think, you know, if I remember right from a few years ago, this wasn't going to have much impact because it is the production of the agricultural commodity, raw honey. 
and in wax and other things that come from the hive. So this is probably not going to have much impact on the revenue for anybody, beekeepers or um, county schools, et cetera. So no problem with the bill. And with that, I will sit for any questions the committee may have. Any questions for the Farm Bureau? Hey, thank you, Mr. Moline. Good. Yeah, oh, oh, here we go. I, I think you answered it. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Any further public comment? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Jim McGagan with the Wyoming Stock Growers Association. I know there's an expectation that at some point in one of these meetings that the ag groups will disagree, but uh, I'm generally in agreement with, with Mr. Moline, but I do have one question. I, I think there's a difference potentially in whether we're separately considering apiculture as uh, an ag use or whether we're quote, including them in livestock. And if, if the intent is that they are livestock, then my recommendation for consideration by the committee would be rather than adding a, another sub item of apiculture that you would go back to the definition of livestock and simply, uh, which the uh, deputy director read to you earlier and simply add bees into that definition rather than create a separate category for the bees. I think that would be a, a clear way to do it if, if the intent is to make them livestock. With that, Mr. Chairman, that's all I would have. Any questions? Okay, well, the intent is to make sure folks who raise honey uh, qualify for the agricultural uh, designation. And so however that works, I trust the attorneys, which I, I know that you have passed the bar. And uh, <laughs> well, the best I'm way not to get saying that this done. is wrong. I'm, I'm right. saying if I, I personally, I would prefer to see it this way, that we don't think of them as, ag as being livestock, because mm -hmm. I think that has other implications as well. So I prefer to see it this way, but... Yeah. I, I get a little nervous when we talk about that we're making them livestock is right. all. Yeah, we'll have to bring the brand inspectors in to see how they do that. Exactly. So, okay. Thank you, all Mr. Right. Chairman. Thank you. <laughs> Any further public comment? Anything online? Nope. Okay. Public comment is closed. Committee, what's your pleasure? Move the bill. Okay. Move by Representative Blackburn. Yes. Seconded by Representative Worf. Okay. Any discussion committee? Uh, do we want to consider an amendment that makes a five to 10 acre requirement no. specifically for uh, for bees? Um, just as one uh, suggestion, obviously it'd be a conceptual amendment. And I, I think that one's straightforward enough. We can trust LSO to work with the Department of Revenue to come up with the precise language. But uh, I, I, if anybody wants to make that amendment, that now would be the time. Mr. Chairman, Jefferson Blackman. I think we're dealing with definitions here. We're not worried about, I don't think this bill is worried about how big the land is or how much money they're going to save or on their taxes because it's ag land. I think it's just a definite bill about definition. So let's That's move on with definition. Okay, very good. Any further discussion, for Mr. Co-Chairman? Yeah, if we did add that, I'd like to get input from the beekeepers before we did that on the acreage deal, see how it would have affect them. Okay, any further discussion? Question. Okay, seeing none, let's go ahead and do a roll call. Mr. Chairman, this is a roll call vote for 23 LSO 199, Apiculture Agricultural Land Use Purpose. Senator French. Senator Kolb. Soft eye. Senator Cost. Aye. Senator Wasserberger. Representative Blackburn. Representative Clausen. Aye. Representative Fortner. No. Representative Heiner. Representative Larson. No. Representative Western. Aye. Representative Wharf. Representative Winter. Chairman Boner, Co-Chairman Eklund. Aye. Mr. Chairman, we have 11 ayes, two noes, one conflict. Okay, thank you very much. The conversation will continue on that one. 
So next up, we have an update for our uh, wild horse um, management. Let's see. Um, yeah, so that, that's the next up. Uh, do we have a representative from the governor's office online by chance? Mr. Chairman, my understanding is that uh, Kate Barlow from the governor's office had intended to um, participate and present her memo that's in the committee materials. However, I understand that um, something must have uh, occurred this morning and she is unable to appear. So, um, but but she did respond that there are no changes from this October update that she sent in the materials to the committee. Yep, so committee and, oh, go ahead. Oh, and, and none of the other um, persons who this committee has been talking with for the last couple of years have um, additional updates. However, there is the um, the small update that there is a, um, the, a, a member of your committee who kind of reminded and urged folks to um, move forward, some of the other folks you've been talking to, to move forward to um, send their letter to accompany the committee's letter that went to the Secretary of the Interior and the Wyoming's Congressional Delegation. So that is um, trying to move that forward too. Okay, yeah, and that's, that's a good, I think Representative Winter was discussing that. And uh, so we have sent a letter, uh, like uh, Mr. Jarvis said, and uh, maybe if you could uh, forward that to the committee, the letter that we sent and the cover letter, I think that'd be helpful. And so we are making progress on that. Now is a discussion about um, you know identifying to everybody involved, the Department of Interior, our congressional delegation, especially that this is still an issue. The BLM has done some good work recently, but it's uh, hasn't fundamentally been solved. Because my concern is that these horses are just going to get back up way above AML if we don't do something fundamentally different with this program. And so. That's, I think that was the tone and tenor of the letter, um, if I remember correctly, and we are moving forward with that um, attempt to really get something going and have a public statement in some form or another from the federal government, from the state of Wyoming, and from everybody involved, that this is a, an issue that does require our continued diligence. Um, and, and so that I want the committee to know that that effort is ongoing, and uh, uh, we can certainly uh, send you the, the letter that we sent a, on your behalf. Um, and I apologize, that probably should have been in the committee materials. It's not, but we'll, we'll get that sent to you. Um, Mr. Chairman, the committee received it on November 2nd and it was oh. and it was sent out November 1st, but I will forward it again so it's top of their email and we can also link to it in the committee materials okay. as well. Very good. Yeah, that'd be great if it was part of the committee materials and I'll do a better job in checking my email. So, <laughs> um, so there's that effort. Um, also, we have the half million dollars that um, the, we appropriated for wild horse management. And you can read the memo committee, um, but it just has a top, I guess, a, a high level reminder. We went at the governor's office, went ahead, and uh, uh, they have signed MOU with our tribes. Uh, and that is a, a update I got from the governor's office just a couple weeks ago. That MOU has been signed for $400,000 to just remove those horses from the land on the reservation since we do not have the red tape we have to go through, um, at least not the BLM red tape. Uh, they can just, they have their sovereignty, they can go ahead and, and take care of that. And that's what they're in the process of doing. Um, kind of a little close to the session for my uh, liking, but as long as we have one gather this fall, I think we'll be in good shape. We can go back to the appropriations committee and say, look, you know, this amount of dollars removed this amount of horses from the land, and we can have a good solid basis for uh, potentially another appropriation. Uh, the other $100,000 is for a, a program we all know and love at the Wyoming R Farm, uh, helping make sure that they continue to meet the federal requirements that are necessary to have that program and work in partnership with the BLM. There was some question as to whether, they, uh, it's my understanding, there's some question as to whether they'd be able to continue that program uh, it's been very successful, very popular. And so the other $100,000 went to the Honor Farm there in Riverton, which we had the opportunity to visit at our last committee meeting. And so that uh, seems to have uh, uh, been going a little bit quicker. I guess the stage is he's a little bit better at spending money um, <laughs> than, than uh, something that requires a little bit more coordination, you know, uh, cap capturing uh, hundreds, if not thousands of horses on the reservation. So, um, so that's a brief update committee. Um, do we have any representatives from the tribes online? Okay, so they're they're busy gathering horses, I hope. And uh, 
So that's where we're at committee. Just so I, you know, uh, so I think there, it's kind of funny how other committees kind of pick this up, it seems all of a sudden, and which is fine. That's great. You know, the more the merrier, but I think it's generated some confusion as to what the state has already been doing for the past year, and what this committee has been doing for several years now to work on this issue and to make it better and working in conjunction with the BLM and important stakeholders. Like uh, I know Mr. McGagna has been very involved uh, in Rock Springs, certainly a big um, concern in that part of the state, the Farm Bureau, all of our ag uh, uh, groups and understand the importance of having competent range management that complies with federal law uh, or multiple use mandate and and uh, complies with the wild horse and burrows act of 1971 so any further discussion or comments on this topic committee no go ahead uh, mr chairman i i guess if the i I'd, I'd encourage the committee to be somewhat diligent on it as chairman boner said the problem hasn't gone away even though we've solved a few little things there may be other ideas that will help us uh, hold these numbers down. Um, there was a lot of talk about sterilization. I, I guess I'd be curious what this, how the state might be able to be involved in that to just slow down the herd size. Uh, that's one thing I can think of. If you have other ideas, uh, we don't have to put all the weight of the thing on our expert here. So others others be thinking of what we might be able to do and we'll we'll do a little research see if that'll if we can help it further than we have and mr chairman i think that's an important point that the half million dollars we, that we appropriated that could have gone for sterilization there's been i think i'm even aware of reports in the media of a group of combat veterans who you know uh, want to go out and, and sterilize these horses and you know the, those fund they could apply for those funds so we, we heard from other um groups to do sterilization that uh, show up to the committee last interim, um, that they could have applied for these funds as well. So uh, those sorts of efforts are, that's kind of what we're missing. We, we got the horse gatherers on the reservation. We got uh, the continuing to work at the Wyoming Honor Farm, but we also, you know, there's those sterilization efforts that, uh, you know, just nobody applied for the, that pot of money. So we want to make it abundantly clear that they can, if they want to, especially if they have a demonstrated track record of success. So that being said, any further discussion committee? Any public comment? Ms. McGagna. Sure. And that is that the facility in Canada where the tribes have typically shipped these horses was just shut down and been converted to a cattle feedlot. So apparently concern is that we've lost the primary location where the tribe was able to move horses at this point in time. Well, that's good to know. I guess we'll look to the south then. But yeah, I think the update will will engage with the tribes, make sure that we can that that's not too much of a disruption there. But if it is, at least that we have a good reason for it. So okay, any further discussions or public comment? Okay. So moving on to our 930 topic, Wyoming fencing laws. Uh so I also could come back down and present uh, 23 LSO 206. Um, now, once again, this is uh, kind of the last topic we have for our interim. Uh, this bill does a few things. Uh, I think one that sticks out in my mind is how to deal with a fence along a, a residential uh, subdivision, but there's all other important updates um, in this piece of legislation as well. So, uh, Mr. Plum, please continue. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, Luke Plum, LSO. Here to discuss this bill uh yeah this bill does two primary things the first one i want to note yeah it does increase the fines for maintaining an unlawful wire fence and so i it, it was interesting to find that uh the penalties for an unlawful wire fence have remained the same in wyoming since 1888 and uh that was when i found it in the session laws had to keep going back but uh yeah so using an inflation calculator uh with data from um i believe it was u.s treasury I guess it was as close as I could get it to make it even round numbers. It currently is a misdemeanor fine of five dollars to one hundred or to twenty five dollars for a first offense for yeah for having an unlawful wire fence fence. And so now with the inflation calculations made, it would be one hundred and fifty dollars to seven hundred and fifty dollars for a first offense. And then for each subsequent offense, the old numbers were twenty five dollars to one hundred dollars. That would change from seven fifty to three thousand. 
uh, just based on inflation from 1888 to 2022. And so that is that is the primary change in that one. And then also in this bill, yes, is the is the discussion of you know the construction and maintenance of partition fences, particularly in subdivisions. So I know one question I, I believe the committee had was yeah, is did we need to update the definition of subdivision? I made no changes specifically to that. This bill or this statutory section um, in the livestock statutes in Title 11 does reference back to Wyoming Statute 185302A7. And uh, so on page four of the bill, I've just included that definition as it's used um, in that other place, just for the committee's consideration. But here, uh, you know, currently as, as current Wyoming law requires that if a perimeter partition fence is built or one essentially becomes a perimeter partition fence, that the landowners are basically required to split those costs for the construction and for the maintenance. And so um, with a specifically within a subdivision, a subdivider is responsible to construct a perimeter partition fence on any part of the subdivision that is adjacent to lands where livestock can legally be run at large. So what this bill does is it kind of puts a little more um, limits on that. So it does still require that the subdivider is responsible for building the fence and the subdivider can still require half the cost be paid, but this one limits that to only to pay the, the adjoining landowner, not the subdivider, would only be required to pay for one half of the actual cost to construct a lawful fence, as is in 1128-102A. So those are the specific statutory uh, types of lawful fences, and then B, the catch-all one. So yeah, so it can't be I, I, kind of the idea here is you can't build a really, really fancy fence and expect you, the adjoining landowner to pay for half of it. It would only be what it would actually cost to build another one of those. And that goes along with paying any additional costs for maintenance of that perimeter partition fence. So that's the big component change here. Um, did also include that currently that if wide livestock wander onto subdi subdivided land, that liability is still on the subdivider. Here it made it also that if a uh, livestock breaches the perimeter partition fence um, to get onto the subdivided land that would still be borne by the subdivider. And then the uh, the last statutory section is just a conforming change to meet for that. So I believe that covers the bill. Uh, it's just the standard effective date of July 1st, 2023. And I would stand for any questions. Hey, thank you, Mr. Paul. Any questions? Mr. Fortner, go ahead. I remember the last committee meeting we had, I think it was over Riverton. There was a guy stood up in the in the in the rows ahead of us there and he talked about a rich man moved in beside his dad's place and uh, he wanted a new fence. And so he just set off the, the survey line and build his own fence. I think that's a much better solution uh, to getting along on the fencing without the fines and, and everybody being re responsible for half the fence for one thing there's a lot of branchers that's just barely getting by that not capable or, or it's not there not within their budget to go out and build 100 miles worth of fence to appease some billionaire that just moved in beside them that's a hardship and that's not something they should have to do i'm not for this bill one little bit thank you so I, I think that's exactly the intent of the bill. It's to ensure that some large developer doesn't require a legacy rancher to pay for half of a very fancy fence. So the bill, it's so clear, is to ensure that uh, that folks in agriculture are not on the hook for you know a developer coming in and and say putting a big brick uh, wall up around the subdivision. So just so we're clear, what the bill does. It does exactly what you're, it addresses that exact concern. And I'm not sure the idea of forcing somebody to construct an entirely new fence instead of only paying for half is a, a good financial deal for the rancher. It, it, we had to build some fences recently in our place and it is not cheap. I, I can tell you that, that right now. So just to be clear what the bill does, it protects the rancher from any financial liability um, from associated with development as it regards fencing. So let's be clear about what the bill does. So go ahead. The way the bill reads, any wire fence constructed. That's the way the bill reads. You have a page and line number? Page two, six all the way down to 17 basically covers any wire fence constructed. 
So that's existing statute. Um, it's longstanding that, and so we're not changing that. The way it works right now, just to back up a little bit, is that if you have a fence, you say one rancher and another have share a fence line, the question is who's responsible for maintaining that fence? The law states that you split the costs. And that's, you know, rancher to rancher, farmer to farmer. So that's not anything that's, so to be clear, the way these bills work, if it's in black print, it's not underlined, that is existing statute. The red print as underlined is what we're adding in the bill. So just so we know, that's that's the way we construct bills in the legislature. Um, it's been a longstanding law that we, um, that when you build a fence or you uh, maintain a fence legally, the neighbors split the cost. So that, that's the way the bill reads. Um, that's that's the current law. So, and Chairman Boner, if I just may, um, on page two, the and to Representative Fortner on page two, this section that is on eleven twenty eight one hundred three, this is more specifically a uh, if you build a fence and it doesn't meet the requirements of a lawful fence, then you're guilty of a misdemeanor. So this is only if you have a wire fence that doesn't meet the statutory construction portions of it. Like you know, there, it's in 1128.102, the previous section before this one. You just have to maintain a wire fence. And it, this these dollar amounts are only if you are found guilty of not maintaining an, a lawful wire fence. If you got a wire fence, or if you put any kind of fence up, no matter what kind of stock you got, and it holds your stock in, that's acceptable to me. Uh, if some, if the neighbor next door don't like your fence so, because it don't it don't hold his stock in, then that shouldn't be a burden on you. That's the way I look at it. And Chairman Boner, just just briefly, uh, Representative Fortner. Currently, the I don't have the exact language, but um, in the previous section, there is kind of a I call it the catch-all provision. If a fence can reasonably keep your stock in then that is considered a lawful fence. Um, this is re really would truly just be if, yeah, if you built an improper fence and would cause, cause issues. I do recognize that, yeah, if someone else's livestock got caught in your wire fence, that might get into where this would apply, but it is there is some, I think, leeway there. This is just, I think, kind of trying to protect some livestock from being injured by a wire fence, but I understand your point. All right, and that's some testimony we heard, I think, at our last committee meeting. What say your livestock does get out, who's responsible for damages. That's the difference between fence in and fence out. And, you know, depending on the species of livestock, that depends, it, it, that, that'll that drive who's actually responsible for that. And it's even different stat, you know, different uh, requirements for cows versus sheep. Something we deal with up here um, quite often. <laughs> and uh, um, so, yeah, I, I believe that's actually in case law, it's not in the statutes. And so that, that's a whole different other can of worms outside the scope of this bill that I'm, I'm not interested in opening right now. But right now we're just focused on, it's good to have this background, but as a reminder, this bill just deals with what happens when a subdivision uh, comes up against a, a ranch and who's responsible for the uh, the pretty fences that go well above and beyond the requirements of uh, what you need to keep livestock in, in the pasture. So any further questions? Okay, thank you, Mr. Plum. Okay, next up we have the Stock Growers Association. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and thank you for bringing this legislation forward as a result of our discussions uh, at the last meeting. The, the second part of this dealing with subdivisions, we think is very appropriate and we're certainly very supportive. I do have a bit of a question on the language on page two with regards to changing the penalties, not that the amounts are incorrect, that that's a reflex of inflation, inflation but uh, an unlawful wire fence, and if you look at the definition in the statute for a wire fence, it's three wires placed certain distances and that. So if if I build a two wire fence, and perhaps I'm doing that because I want to be more wildlife friendly or something, and that's a big thing nowadays, building wildlife friendly fences. Uh, and 
the the question I have here, it says a civil action for all damages to animals. I'm not certain what the definition of an animal is. My concern is that with these higher penalties, if offense that I have that doesn't meet the literal definition of a, of a uh, legal fence were to catch a deer in it, would uh, would some party be inclined to bring an, an action against me because a deer was caught in my fence? I'm not sure if animals is limited to livestock as used in this context, or if it would be uh, any species of animal, which include wildlife. And so I, uh, with the higher penalties, I just want to be sure that we look into this to make sure we aren't creating a trap that could be used against livestock producers. Okay, very good. So it might be as simple as striking animals and inserting livestock. Inserting livestock okay. or something like Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. And once again, that definition of livestock is to be pretty well, important. I, you don't want to <laughs> somebody catching a bee. Then, then if we catch a bee in there. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways. Um, that's true too. Although the definition of livestock for this purpose is different than the definition that's in the uh, in the tax code. So. All right. Very good. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So any, any questions for the stock? Girl? That's something we can look at further before if, assuming this bill moves forward, right. just to make sure we aren't creating a, a trap type of a situation. All right. And that, that's all, all, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. Always dangerous to look in the statute. It hasn't been updated since statehood. So we'll, uh, so any, any questions for the stock growers? Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And okay, next up, we have the Farm Bureau. <laughs> just think this might be the last time you have to hear from me for the session i i knew i was going to make a few people ever extra happy on that brett moline wyoming farm bureau uh certainly concurring with mr mcgagna with the definition of animals that's a point i hadn't thought of i think limiting it to livestock is a good idea i really appreciate the changes in the on page three about including maintenance on there i think that's a extremely great idea and with that i would sit for any questions supporting the bill any questions committee all right thank you thank appreciate you. it okay do anybody from the county commissioners association oh great good. okay good morning mr chairman let me see if i can get my camera to work apologize Mr. Eamon, welcome to the Agriculture Committee. Once we get you up here, you miss, you're missing out on a snowy day here in Douglas, so <laughs> well, good to see you online. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. I'm Jeremiah Reeman here on behalf of the Wyoming County Commissioners Association. I've had the chance to review the bill. I've also had a few commissioners do that, as well as a deputy county attorney. And as it stands right now, we have no issues or concerns with the draft bill. And and uh, we'll continue to review it in advance of the session, but I don't anticipate any issues moving forward. Hey, thank you for that testimony. Any uh, questions for the county commissioners? Okay, so I think, you know, part of the reason why you're here is we heard some testimony about um, a situation, but I believe is in Uinta County, um, uh, dealing with, uh, we're, and I have to, you know, need a reminder what exactly it was but uh, basically there's a question as to whether this law is currently being followed um, in the context of a subdivision and i'm not sure if you had any insight into that particular situation or not mr chairman i'm not aware of that particular situation but i will uh, certainly reach out to the uina county commissioners uh, as well as their county attorney and see if i can uh, obtain any additional information uh, in relationship to this Okay, yeah, thank you. And sorry to put you on the spot like that, but it just came to me all of a sudden that you know we probably need some follow up. But yeah, it's certainly nothing that we need today. But uh, uh, thanks, yeah, continuing engagement with your um, organization, given you know the fact that they they are heavily involved with subdivisions and everything. I think that's going to be uh, appropriate. We do appreciate your input, so, Representative Worf. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, I can talk about that if you'd like. I, I did have a, a constituent that contacted me. Uh, I believe this is right along the Utah-Wyoming line. I think it was a Utah subdivision, as I recall. But uh, they they contacted me and didn't kind of know what to do about it. But that's what I told them is, you know, I told them to talk to the uh, 
to the livestock producers, I said, usually, you know, they, they'll know who has to maintain that fence. But that's what's happened is they put in a, a subdivision and the fence was not being maintained and he was being told that they had to pay for it and i said i had, i said i don't think that's the the way it is but i said talk to the the livestock guys they'll know and and i know that's what they did they contacted the the livestock guys and and the the rancher and was able to to come up with it but i think this is a great bill myself i i've you know seen subdivisions that have been put in like this and then after the fact, after the the property has been developed, now all of a sudden you have a problem because nobody thought about how you maintain that fence. And it isn't fair. It isn't fair to to put that in there and then tell the livestock producer you got to maintain something that is beyond what what most livestock producers would put. <clears throat> and so I, I think the standards are there, but I think it's a great bill. I would encourage the support and the passage or the adoption anyway. Okay, thank you, Representative. Any further uh, questions for the county commissioners? Okay, well, thank you, Jeremiah. Good to see you as always. And uh, we'll continue to look forward to your input if you have any on this uh, piece of legislation, if it moves forward. So thank you. any further public comment? Okay, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Keith Kennedy, on my own behalf, uh, and I would particularly urge you to support that portion on pages four and five. Uh, that change. And and I say that as someone who has been on Albany County Planning and Zoning Commission for the last six years, uh, I can think of no subdivision uh, application that we've gotten where the evaluation from uh, Game and Fish Department wasn't that there was game-friendly game friendly fencing uh, for that subdivision. And and I, I think it's particularly important for the livestock producers to have that protection that they're not liable for those damages if a subdivider observes that. Uh, I can I can think of quite a few animals that domestic animals that would go ahead and go into that subdivision and and at the very least help harvest the flower beds. So uh, with that, uh, I'd be I'd welcome any questions. Okay, hey, any questions for Mr. Kennedy? Okay, hey, thank you for your input, Thanks. sir. Okay, hey, any further public comments? Oh, go ahead. Oh, we got uh, realtors online? Okay, great. Mr. Chairman, can my camera is, doesn't seem to be working, but I am here. Good, we can hear you. So uh, uh, it's unfortunate your camera isn't working, but we can hear you just fine. So go ahead and proceed. Okay, um, my name is Lori Oberkite. I'm with the Wyoming Realtors and we support this bill. Many, uh, several years ago, we worked with um, the egg producers to, um, up, to add the language that you see the existing language on the bottom of page three and the top of page four. When we were discussing that issue, it was about animals wandering into a subdivision and eating someone's posies, and we didn't think that that should be an egg producer's concern. Um, we did not discuss at that time the cost, the additional cost if they wanted a, a real fancy um, fence or the cost if they uh, you know, exceeded what was required by the egg producers. So I think this is very appropriate. Um, we we stand in support of the bill. Um, we will uh, use it if the bill moves forward. Um, I will give you my promise that we'll use this to help educate our um, members on what the Wyoming fencing laws are. I think it's very important that our realtor members as they um, advocate and, and guide their buyers and sellers and clients and customers, that they are aware of this. And so I will give you uh, my promise that this will be a great launching point for that type of education for our realtors. And I thank the ag community for bringing this forward. We want to be good neighbors and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Okay, uh, thank you, Lori. I appreciate that. It is true that good fences make good neighbors and clarity benefits everybody. So any questions for the Realtors Committee? 
Okay. Well, I appreciate your, uh, your uh, testimony and look forward to your continued input if this bill moves forward. Thank you. Okay. Any further public comment? Anybody in the room? I guess we got through just about everybody, but no. Okay. All right. <laughs> okay. Public comment is closed. Committee, what's your pleasure? Okay. Move the bill by Senator Cost, seconded by Representative Blackburn. Okay. Any discussion committee? Proposed Senator Coast, Cole. I propose an amendment, uh, page two, line eight, uh, striking animals and inserting livestock. Okay, it's Mr. been moved, Mr. Chairman, and it looks like we have a second from. Well, yep, yeah, there there might be a second one here. You go to page four, line thirty. The owner of the animal. And, and it kind of says what the animal is, but I think if we put in livestock. Um, okay, so on page four, you're talking about? Yeah. And it says, says animal person. again, and I don't know if we want to clarify that or not. Well, it's a part of a, a sentence that references is. livestock began sentence. So can, for the members of the public, it says, any person owning or having in his possession or charge any livestock or domesticated buffalo, which breaches into the any lawful enclosure belonging to someone other than or the animal is liable. And do so we wanna, do I, we want to just leave animals since it's pretty clear. And we, we can ask also okay. if the beginning of the sentence is sufficient to you know denote that it is livestock, not any animal. All right. Is that correct, Mr. Plum? Thank you, Chairman Boner. Yes, I think how this sentence read, reads is that when it says the owner of the animal later in the sentence, it is referring to any livestock okay. or domesticated buffalo. And I guess I don't know off the top of my head, but I don't know if domestic buffalo is included enough into the livestock that it may be better to leave it as animal just to make sure those are all included. Yeah. Buffalo are. I second it. Okay. At, as, as, right. Okay, no discussion. Question being called. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. No. That motion carries. Any further discussion on this bill committee? Okay. Let's go do a roll call for sponsorship. Mr. Chairman, this is a roll call vote for 23 LSO 206, lawful fences, subdividers responsibility and liability as amended. Senator French. French. Senator Cole? Aye. Senator Cost? Aye. Senator Wasserberger? Representative Blackburn? Representative Clausen? Aye. Representative Fortner? Representative Heiner? Aye. Representative Larson? Aye. Representative Western? Representative Worf? Aye. Representative Winter? Aye. Chairman Boner? Co-Chairman Eckland. Aye. Mr. Chairman, we have 13 ayes, one no. Okay, very good. That's the last bill draft. Um, so it looks like we're a little bit ahead of schedule committee. And, and so if could somebody call the state fair folks, make sure they're they know that we're running quite a bit ahead of schedule, I guess. And and Doug, are you representing them completely or, or, or oh very good. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay. Very good. Okay. So with that, uh, we have other business. Uh, uh, Director Miyamoto, you are here today. Do you have any anything you want to bring before the committee? Sure. Okay. Very good. Okay. Okay. So with that, um, we have a little bit of time. We'll take a break. Uh, Representative, do you want to? Go now? Okay. Okay, so we'll go ahead and take a break. Uh, let's call it until about 10 o'clock, 15 minutes. Then we'll hear all about the great things that are happening here in Douglas at the Wyoming State Fair. So.
Okay, folks, let's go ahead and take our seats. All right, well, we got enough of a quorum here, I think, to go ahead and proceed. The last uh, topic for our interim is uh, dealing with the Wyoming State Fair. We did have a brief update um, in Riverton. Appreciate your attendance there, Director uh, Conkle. But I uh, uh, wanted to uh, highlight, I think, an ongoing effort that I think is probably going to require some legislative input and approval over the next year or two. Um, and I think this is, a, you know, just... I've said it before, but, you know, this has been one of the success stories of state government over the past several years, uh, starting in 2018 with the uh, founding of the State Fair Board. And you know, I think that really uh, changed the direction of the State Fair in a positive way. And, you know, we it's kind of a cliche to say we do more with less, but I think this is where we can point to lots of numbers, even in spite of the budget cuts that we've all been facing, including the State Fair over the past uh, couple of years. We have uh, have some pretty positive um um, input and positive uh, movement and in, in terms of revenue and attendance and so on. So um, all being said, I'll go ahead and uh, uh, kick it off back to the Wyoming State Fair. Uh, Courtney Conkle is here again. So go ahead and uh, take it away. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you to everybody for having me here today. Last time I saw you all, we talked a little bit about the 2022 Wyoming State Fair as a standalone event. My job is pretty much three major components. It is the fairgrounds and event complex, which is 60 structures, 118 acres, and about 400 events each year. So you do the math on that. We average a little bit more than one event day per calendar day. So we stay very, very busy. Then we have the Wyoming State Fair, which is a wonderful tradition. We're so happy to be able to honor that tradition here in the great state of Wyoming. Then perhaps the biggest part of my job that we don't talk about very much or that we don't always see is the facility maintenance and infrastructure side. This truly takes up probably about 40% of my time. It is a massive, massive component. As you probably are familiar, the state fairgrounds is 118 acres that's comprised of predominantly five properties that were deeded to the fair to make sure that we could have it here in Commerce County in Douglas. That makes it a very, very interesting fabric of a fairgrounds. So we've got 60 structures that were built over the last 100 plus years that all have varying degrees of useful life left. Right now, what we're focused on is extending the useful life to the maximum possible capacity and also the ability to differentiate those facilities on a year-round basis. What I'm going to be reporting on today is a brief update on our 2020 master plan and where we're at with that. So in front of you, you should have two packets. You should have my presentation for today. And I have also spent the last day making copies. So you all have a copy of the master plan also. How many of you remember when we were going through the master plan process? All right. So there was a few of you that probably got off the hook. The master plan process was incredibly in-depth. It was something that we started in 2018 after the board was seated, the initial board. So what I'm gonna to do today is I'm gonna walk you through what that process looked like and a little overview of where we're at with those near-term projects. When the master plan began, it actually got underway in 2019 and the existing fair board spent a tremendous amount of time working on this master plan. They really felt like this was gonna be something that was going to help guide us into the future for the fair as an event complex and as an asset to the state of Wyoming. The three major objectives that the organization ended up really looking at, we wanted to focus on creating opportunities for non-fair time revenue. That was a really critical component and it went hand in hand with that statutory rewrite. We also wanted to be able to focus on increasing fair participation and ultimately increasing revenues. And then the third major component was to reprogram and redevelop the different segments of the fairgrounds. So on that front, we're talking um, essentially experience planning. So there's regions of the fairgrounds when you go for an event that are more inclined for smaller private events. You know, they are for 
galas, banquets, fundraisers, but we also have the swell capacity to honor something like a major, major music festival, which are the types of things that we'll look at bidding out here in the next few years. Over the past five years, we've undergone some serious, serious change as an organization. This started with the statutory rewrite that led to some changes within our department, within our team, including me coming on board here in 2019. Since then, we've also had significant administrative turnover and operations turnover. So we've got a pretty fresh team and a pretty fresh board still. When you really think about government and seated boards, we are on our second term right now. So we do have some new folks that have joined the board, which is going to be refreshing. And we also have some folks that have been here since day one. So it's a, a really healthy mix that we've got right now. In 2020, we completed the master plan and rolled that out. The intention of this master plan is to give us a guiding compass for the organization, for the facility from 2020 through the end of 2030. So when we're looking at state government, when we're looking at a facility that's over 100 years old, this is really just a segment. We will be focused on making sure that our master plan is something that is constantly utilized and that we're consistently working on refining, growing, and redefining because there's also some elements that we have more information now. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. On page three, there's the overview of the entire campus and what it would look like post master plan. Of course, this was done in 2020. There are some elements that have shifted even just since this. One that I'll point out that is on our near term, everything that's bolded is a project that we either have completed or underway. The focus of this was gonna be 2021, 2022, and 2023 to be project years for the near term. The Silver Arena is something that's mentioned about 35 times throughout the master plan. It is an existing outdoor arena that is right next to the Pepsi Equine Center, which we'll get to take a look at today. It has the ability to increase our revenues on an annual basis by over $125,000 but it also would open up some additional revenue in the sense that right now we do um, indoor silver arena attempt in our Ford Pavilion. We have to haul in dirt, build an arena and try to utilize it with a very limited season because it is so intensive to haul the dirt in and out. So we also use that building, the 80,000 square foot enclosed Ford Pavilion as a makeshift indoor arena. If we were to be able to enclose the silver arena as an existing infrastructure project, we would then be able to open up new revenue in silver arena and open up the Ford Pavilion for additional year round usage. What that does for us is it gives us the ability to differentiate revenue significantly and extend our season to be a full year round season for our indoor arena, which is something we do not have. One project I want to talk a little bit about that is on here on your near term as I've got to fix this. Sorry, it's bothering me. I don't know if that's driving everybody else crazy. All right, let's talk about the removal of F Barn. The removal of F Barn was something that was focused on in the 2020 master plan because it had never. Oh, do I? Okay. When we released the master plan in 2020, the F barn had not been used in quite some time. We had invested some major maintenance funds into it to be able to utilize it back in 2012. However, we did not have any shows that had the capacity to utilize it to demand that usage. Since 2020, we've been able to recruit three shows that are now using that barn three times a year, as well as having it as our quarantine area for state fair. So when I talk about the master plan is incredible. It's very, very important. And we have more information now. That's one of those things where if we hadn't had COVID, if we hadn't had that recruitment tool where Wyoming was able to service those events, we would not have to, to keep the F barn. However, now we have demand. So we're not, we're not going to demolish something that we now have demand for. So we'll keep this very, very fluid as we go through the entire process of these next 10 years. And we'll consistently look forward to the next 10 years. So that means if it's 2025, we would like to be looking and planning through 2035. So we've got that near-term, mid-term, long-term facility planning that's consistent and maintains year over year. 
the way that the master plan is broken out at the very, very back of your full master plan, these um, near-term, mid-term, long-terms are broken out into a singular spreadsheet. And it's probably our most valuable tool because it's so critical that we always know why we're doing what we're doing and how that evolves over time. In the midterm, which was originally gonna be 2024 through 2026, we've actually been able to complete the majority of our near-term projects to the point where we are now able to actually move into the midterm. The silver arena that I mentioned briefly, we are currently out for request for qualifications for a level one, level two feasibility study that will help us tremendously to make sure that it is the right choice for our state to invest in. If we're able to come back with a, a feasibility study that shows that this is a viable project, it would do tremendous things, not only for the state fair, but for the state of Wyoming, because we would be able to bring in so much new business from outside of state. So economically, the, the driving factors there are going to be huge. And that ripple effect is going to be very beneficial, not only for us as the state fair, but for the state as a whole. Okay. And on that point, talking about, uh, you know, bringing folks around the state, is that particularly focused on, say, the Front Range of Colorado? Um, it's my understanding that's what we're, our prime market is with maybe some folks who have a horse or whatever, who maybe aren't too enthralled with the way things are going down there that like appreciate coming up to a small town in Wyoming and, and uh, remembering the, the way their state used to be, perhaps. Is that, is, that a, is that a fair assessment there? Absolutely. The other thing that happened the past few years with venues that have the potential like ours does, a lot of them were completely shuttered. And so now we've got bid opportunities that we wouldn't have had before. So when we look at the differentiation of what can we bring to our state that we haven't been able to have, or maybe we haven't aggressively gone after, we've got a lot of not only new revenue potential, but new relationship potential there too, that not only are they coming to the Wyoming State Fairgrounds, but they're coming into the state from surrounding regions. And some of them are even flying here for looking at our venue for event production. And that's gonna be something that I think uh, a huge portion of our future is going to rely on of having some of these large scale events that want to come and build their home base here in the great state of Wyoming. We also, when we're looking at the facility, we have, I've mentioned dozens of structures. You'll get to see some of them today. We have structures that are state of the art compared to other venues. We've got some really, really remarkable assets. And then we have some things that we have unfortunately neglected. So when we go through this a little bit later in the presentation, I'll talk about major maintenance and what a huge asset that's been. Being able to utilize major maintenance and repair and retention schedules on a long-term rotating schedule is going to be a saving grace for us. It's something that we have not done historically, and we've had to pay that price. We've had to pay that price in usage, and we've had to pay that price because instead of being able to budget and say, okay, we know that this has got a 20 year useful lifespan. So we need to be forecasting for when we need to ask for this again on our major maintenance. We need to start watching it at that 17, 18 year mark. We've had some emergency repairs. My goal is to minimize those emergency repairs. We're still going to have some just with the, the nature of what we do and how we do it. But there's some elements that if we can be better stewards and a little bit more proactive, we'll be able to maintain our facility in a much better capacity longer. The long-term projects are things that we'll be reevaluating as we get closer to that, that date mark. But a huge amount of the stuff we've been able to accomplish not using state funds, not using special requests, not even having to use CAPCON. And a significant portion of that is due to our community relationships. We've been able to partner with the Converse County Tourism Board and Converse County, as well as utilizing our own major maintenance funding to be able to accomplish a lot of what I've referred to as the low hanging fruit that's on here that shows that we don't just view the master plan as a paperweight. You know, that's something that we hear a lot um, when we talk about having a master plan is there's a lot of organizations that go through the master planning process. And then the second that this document comes out on the website, you go, thank God that's done. And it is like a marriage. This is the start, not the end. So we take this really, really seriously. And it's also really nice to to have somebody that's an expert on this. And our master planners, this is what they do. This is how they, they make a living is by planning venues like ours. 
So we take their suggestions um, very, very seriously, and we want to make sure that we're being responsible with state funding in general. So there's a few projects on here that you'll see in near term that we actually won't request funding for because we'll figure out other avenues to get those projects completed. Right now, we're very, very focused on the longevity of the organization, on the longevity of the facilities, and on being good stewards of state funds. So we're not going to just come in and ever say, we want this plan fully funded. That's that's not how any of us would run our private businesses, and that's not how we intend to run the fair. I've also created a little bit of an overview of our facility projects from 2019 through today. This is probably one of my top five favorite parts of what we get to do. We had some projects that had not been backburnered, but they'd been, um, we were waiting until the master plan was completed. So we knew if they were projects that made sense to move forward on because it really doesn't look good if you invest all this money in masonry and windows and then bulldoze the masonry and windows. So the board was um, incredibly intelligent, especially after just being seated, that they waited on some of these projects. They said, let's not pursue these today. Let's make sure that there's still demand for them. That means that as soon as the master plan rolled out and we knew our direction, we hit the ground running. So there's so, so many projects that we've been able to tackle just in the last three years. And I just wanted to take a few minutes and talk about some of the ones that we've got going on on site currently. Some of them are not even on here because I didn't have enough space. Um, I'm sure that we all hear about Ford Electric and how there will never be enough electric. We could triple the electric in there and there wouldn't be enough electric. That's because of what we use it for during fair time, that it is predominantly a steer barn, now sheep also. And both of those animals pull a lot of power when we're talking about blowing, fitting, trimming, fans, et cetera. So we did complete the Ford Pavilion electrical. I'm sure at some point you guys will be approached that there needs to be more electrical. We have enough electric to keep all of the animals well. So from an animal welfare perspective, we're meeting the demands there. And it's also much, much safer. So this was our first year in several years that from a safety standpoint, that building is not going to be shut down because we do not have cords that are not up to code. So that's that's good news on our front. The other thing that it does that we have that full distribution is that the Ford Pavilion can now be used year round. So if we wanted to do a winter stock show, if we wanted to do a hot tub show, if we wanted to do an RV show, we have the ability to differentiate that revenue on a year round basis. Right now, we, right now we do use the Ford Pavilion as a winter arena with a very limited season because of how extensive it is for us to get it set up and torn down. That arena will open in early December and it'll run through mid April. So it's a pretty short season. If we're able to get the silver arena enclosed, open up Ford Pavilion, we'll have about seven more months of revenue from the Ford Pavilion to be used as a multi-purpose event venue. And we'll have an additional about 100,000 new revenue, new revenue, not revenue that's currently existing in Ford Pavilion Winter Arena in the enclosed silver arena. So there's some really cool synergies there that might be able to be possible. Has anybody ever been in the State Fair Crow's Nest? I'm so sorry. Um, the rule if you ever go up there is don't eat lunch before because you will probably fall through the the floor. Um, it was going to be on our tour today, but the weather is a little bit nasty, so I won't make us go up there. The The crow's nest has been something that we weren't quite sure what to do with it because we weren't quite sure the longevity of being able to use the arena as such. And it is something that's addressed in the master plan to reformulate the arena a little bit. So what we've been able to do, we've structurally stabilized it. So now we could all probably go up there and be safe, which is awesome. But we're also designing it in a way where it's going to be mobile. So if we need to move it, we have the ability to. So once again, looking at that long game where just because we need to invest in it now, make sure it's safe, make sure it's structurally sound. We don't want to get to the point 10 years from now where we've invested hundreds of thousands of dollars in something that now we don't have use for. So everything that we're doing is a domino that we're lining up. So we're not wasting any money. We don't want to waste any money. We also installed a Ansel system in the McKibben cafeteria. 
the goat barn electric is now up to code also, which is nice. We're still working on uh, public service announcements for the Pepsi Equine Center. We ordered those this time last year and they are just now getting installed. Uh, some of the stumbling blocks that we've been running into with our major maintenance projects is just supply chain. And I'm sure you guys hear that a lot. It's been very interesting. So when you're here for next year's fair, there will be PA systems that you can actually hear that don't sound like Charlie Brown, which from a from a usability standpoint is great, but also from a public safety standpoint, it's really important that if we ever need to get people out of those buildings or off the fairgrounds, we're able to do so in a clear and concise manner. We also have new ticket booths that have, it's the little things, right? Um, Ventura County Fair was just robbed for $518,000 cash because they didn't have safety mechanisms within their cash room and within their ticket booths. So when we were designing our ticket booths two years ago, we made sure that everything has a dual lock system. We made sure that everything has a people. So if somebody's knocking, you can see through. And we've also gone to the ability to offer credit card sales at every gate. So we're trying to limit the amount of actual cash on site because it is a liability for the state. Um, of course, we hire folks that are bonded, but you read something like that from a big fair that's got a lot of history. And I mean, they got robbed a house and a half. It's crazy. So those elements that we want to enhance guest experience, we want it to be efficient, but we also want to make sure it's safe. So there's a lot of different components that we have to be thinking about and looking into when we're in the design process for these different um, assets for the fair. We also recently got an SL100 stage, which if you don't know stages, it is like the Mercedes stage. It's really, really nice. We had um, the Pepsi stage that was an existing structure, wooden stage, stationary. The SL has the ability to be mobile, so we're able to actually put it away, winterize it, so we're extending that useful life. It's not out in the elements all year round. It's also something that we can rent, which is huge for us. You know, it's one more component where now we have another asset that can actually be a moneymaker for the state of Wyoming, even though it was something that we already had. So when we're trading like for like, and when we're looking at the longevity of the organization, we want to make sure that we're getting things that make sense, even as the organization changes and those demands change. So that entrepreneurial mindset that's going to help us. And it's really nice when you can put it away for the season and not get it out in the winter elements. How many of you have been in the rodeo office? Last year, the rodeo office, um, started to peel apart. It was about 35 years old. So one of our newer buildings on the fairgrounds, but it started to peel, moisture got inside and mushrooms started to grow. So even though we are agriculture and we love agriculture, we don't want you to go into a building that you rented and have mushrooms everywhere throughout the floor. So we tried our best to remediate, but it was on our master plan and in our major maintenance requests to be able to restore that building. In the environment that we live in today, it is cheaper to replace that type of building than it is to restore. So we have the new rodeo office installed. It just got side paneling. We're still waiting on ADA ramps, but that's huge. And that also gives us the ability for things like high school rodeo. That was one of their biggest complaints in past years was the rodeo office. There's been mold in there. There's been um, leakage, plumbing issues. There's been some serious challenges with those that without starting from scratch and then maintaining the building the way it needs to be maintained we didn't have a whole lot of options. So you'll get to see that briefly today, but huge project and something that we were able to complete in tandem with the approval from State Building Commission, but utilizing major maintenance in our project manager. And then right now, today, we're out to RFQ for the Silver Arena. This is for a level one, level two feasibility study. We're very, very optimistic that everything comes back and supports this. So that way we can make this investment for the future of our state and be able to bid these big shows out on a year round basis, get those heads in beds, get people to come visit our community and also to be able to utilize it year round if we are to start producing additional events also. And then a few things that didn't make it on here because they're not contracted yet, but they are out to bid if you would like to 
get updates on this next time I meet with you guys. We're refinishing floors in the Upper Ag Building in Fort Reno. We're working on some restrooms. We're also exploring what we can do with the existing dairy barn structure. The dairy barn is about 50 years old, but it's got some major maintenance issues for a building that's really not that old. A huge portion of that is some drainage components that have really, really damaged the wood structure that's in that building. It's outlined in the master plan as a near-term project to give it a renovation so we can extend the useful life for the next seven to 10 years. And then it is also outlined in the next seven to 10 years to do a total renovation of the dairy barn. We're waiting on another structural engineer's opinion, but it is in much worse condition than any of us realized. So it is something that I may update you guys with that we're not able to do a significant investment to get us through the next seven to 10 years because we might need to pursue a more intense structural upgrade sooner for safety purposes. And then a couple other things that are not on here because they are not technically facilities projects, but they're exciting things for us. We do not have a surveillance program at the fair. So we don't have cameras. We don't have, um, we have some, but they're like, Amazon cameras, they're not high quality, they're not high grade. The law enforcement academy that's also here in Converse County is going through a major, major upgrade on their camera systems. So we'll actually get their used camera systems, get them up, get them installed at the fairgrounds. And then eventually when we're ready for an upgrade, we'll be able to run those through major maintenance. So instead of having to bother you guys as legislators with exception requests, that's something that we are really focused on. If there's a way to Still go through proper channels, but not um, not have to bother you guys every time that we have a unique need that we haven't needed before. We really want to be creative there because we want to be good partners. And if we ask for something, it really means we need it. And then just the last thing I wanted to to kind of bring up is our revenues. We've gone through some budget transitions over the past few years with those level one, level two, level three, step one, step two, step three budget reduction since 2020. And they've definitely impacted what we're able to do. However, they haven't impacted our revenues in a negative way. And this is not profitability based. This is true gross revenues based. So when we really look at the PL, we're actually in a much better place than we have been because we've also gone through those budget reductions. And I've segmented this out into two categories into our 0801, which is fair operations, and then 0803, which is interim events and year-round operations. And you can see that year-over-year -year growth. 2022 is trending on both of these also. We just don't have finished numbers yet. But I think that this speaks volumes to the team that we currently have at the State Fair. We've got a very driven, very entrepreneurial-minded team. And they want to be really, really, really good at what they do. And that helps make all of us look really good. So if you see them today when we're out at the tour, please give them a few minutes and um, thank them for the work that they're doing behind the scenes. Um, right now we have eight full-time individuals that work at the fair. Those eight folks oversee all 400 events, the state fair, the year-round operations and the maintenance of the facilities. So they stay pretty dang busy. And that's something that we will have to look at in the next few years is how do we make sure that it's sustainable and that we're able to continue this growth and part of that is probably gonna be having to do a team restructure. We've got four seasonal team member positions that we're generally not able to fill. That predates COVID, that is not a new issue for us because we are competing in a market that has a limited population and we're only able to pay what we're able to pay. So some elements that we'll have to, to keep working together on creative solutions for. But with the master plan, with the vision for the fair, with the state fair board, with the support of you guys, and of course with the patrons and with the folks that rent the facility, we've got really, really good partners. And with those goals that we originally set out, you know, looking back to 2019 when the master plan was getting ready to roll out, are we maximizing revenues? Yes. Do we need to continue to maximize those? Absolutely. We've got a lot of room to grow still. Are we increasing fair participation and fair revenues? Yes, we're checking that box. Do we still have so much room for, for growth? We really, really do. 
And then are we working on that reprogramming and redevelopment on a year round basis and for the fair specifically? Yes, we're moving in the right direction there. So I think seeing the growth over the past few years is exciting, but it's just the beginning and we have to remember that. It's like what I said about the master plan. It's a really expensive paperweight if that's all it is. And a few good years are the start of something. It's not a trend that we anticipate moving back in the wrong direction. So we're aggressive, we're excited, and we're looking forward to the future of the Wyoming State Fair and the State Fairgrounds. And today, is everybody coming on the tour? Please? Okay, there will be prizes. So that way, if you... <laughs> there we go, that's why there's prizes. So what we'll do today is we'll get to show you a few of the areas that are not so glitzy and glamorous. You know, we have a lot of really great stuff, but we've got some elements that um, are not so great. So what we'll start with today is we'll go to the upper campus and we'll go to the dorms. We'll start with Bridger and then we'll go to Laramie. Bridger's not quite as nice, but it does have running water. Laramie is nicer digs, but there is no water. And then we'll go ahead and circle down to the Pepsi Equine Center, we'll look at Silver Arena, and then we'll go into Ford Pavilion. But more than anything, we appreciate the support that you guys have given us as the State Fair, as the State Fair Board, and as a staff over the past few years, and always, but we know it's been a huge time of transition since 2018. And without the bandwidth and the grace that we've been given, we wouldn't have been able to make this, made the strides that we already have made, but it's just the beginning and we're looking forward to Lots and lots of good things here in the future for the State Fair. Okay, well, thank you for your presentation. Thank you for your continued work. Um, any questions, committee? Go ahead, Senator Kolb. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, welcome. Uh, I just wanted to ask a few questions. One of them was, do you have any interaction with the, with the Board of County Commissioners around here in the county? Do they support you in any way? Senator, thank you very much. Yes, we're very, very blessed with the commissioners that we do have. I go and visit with them maybe every other month and I'll go and do a state fair report. We'll talk about the events that we've had ongoing. And then we also serve as the county fairgrounds because Converse County does not have a fairground. So they rent the property from us to produce the county fair. So there's a synergistic relationship on that front. We also have an MOU with the county because they don't have the expense of having a fairgrounds on a year-round basis. And that MOU outlines not only cash, because we do get $55,000 in cash annually from them above and beyond what their rental of the fairgrounds looks like, but we also get about $15,000 in in-kind partnership. So with our team, I mentioned we've got four members on operations. They actually get quite a bit of assistance from the county through that in-kind. So when we're talking about moving all the dirt into the arena that we'll see today, moving it out, that's actually Road and Bridge that comes and supports us and helps us with that. So it's a very, very dynamic relationship. Um, there's always room for growth and betterment, but we're lucky to have who we have in the commission currently. That is follow-up. Well, I know they should be paying a little bit more. We're in the millions of dollars in Sweetwater to our fair. So I think they have a great opportunity and appreciate your work, but I did have one thing that kind of raised my eyebrow, and it's about rental of equipment to uh, the public, and because I, I'm very aware that we shouldn't be competing against uh, the taxpayers with taxpayer-funded equipment, so I think that's a cautionary note in my mind that we don't breach that trust with the public-private partnership and compete against them. You know, particularly on that stage rental you mentioned. So, but I do know you're starved for money, and I the state has not maintained their buildings well, and I understand the challenge, and I support what you're doing. But just wanted to mention that, and thank you for explaining things. Thank you. And there is a statute that does state, as the state fair specifically, that we're not able to compete with private business. So anytime that we're doing pricing, we make sure that we're pulling the median pricing. We get full pricing, and something like the stage we're looking at is there competition in the surrounding area? So that way we're not stepping on any toes because we also, we need those folks to come and support the fair and the fairgrounds on a year round basis. So I appreciate your insights into that. Right, I'd say that's an element. It's, you know, just being here locally, that's always an opportunity for uh, some friction between the fair and the community. I, I think it's, 
improved dramatically over the past few years, even, um, you know, say with the uh, RV rentals, I, I, that used to be like the main source of revenue as a kind of a focus. And that's, I, I, correct me if I'm wrong, director, but that's no longer the focus in terms of off season and revenue generation. It's, you know, it, it's still there. Folks want to be or not undercutting anybody, not that they necessarily were before, but uh, I'll tell you what, I haven't heard as many, those were the really calls I used to get when I was new in the legislature about, you know, the local RV parks and that I don't get any those calls anymore. So always, you know, when we do stuff like fairs or state parks or anything like that, there's always an opportunity, I think, but my impression is that we've, uh, it's been much improved over the past few years. So any further questions for me, uh, Senator French. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman. Do you consult with other fair managers from around the state on issues or whatever they may have uh, after their fair is over and when their their people bring their exhibits uh, down here? Thank you, Senator. That's a very good question. We have a pretty strong network of Wyoming fairs. We have the Wyoming Association of Fairs, which meets annually in September, and we all come together and we're able to talk about our fair seasons and the challenges that we saw. They're also able to give me a heads up of any challenges that they had at the county fair level that might roll up to the state fair since we do compete within the same season. And then on a little bit more macro scale, there's the Rocky Mountain Association of Fairs, which is about 400 fairs from 10 states within this region. And I just got back from that conference on Sunday evening. It is remarkable to go and meet with these other fair managers and with other folks that work at fairs, other legislators, to hear about their challenges and how often they do mirror our own. So we're able to, to learn from each other, get to know each other, and then build that network. So we're not only competing within our market to say, okay, how can we be the best fair in the state? But then we're able to compete with other fairs and say, okay, we really, really like what they're doing over there. How can we repackage that for the state of Wyoming to make sure that we've got something new to offer the folks that come and visit us at our fair or year round? Next weekend, we go to the international version, which is about 2,000 fairs, and this year it's in Indianapolis. It's called the International Association of Fairs and Expos, and even though we come back a little bit tired and a little worse for the wear, it is so inspiring and so rejuvenating to see that what we do really does matter, and it also really helps to remember that it is an industry we do have a network and we're able to to all make each other better through what we learn at our own regional levels. Hey, any further questions, Mr. Co-Chairman? Yes, I <clears throat> thank you for the presentation. That was really, really good. It's obvious you're passionate about it and uh, so are the people, I guess, uh, from the committee, I'd like for you to go back to the people that need to be thanked, your board, uh, the whole community of Douglas and, and Converse County have really figured out how to put on a state fair and, and use this facility so that it'll pay for itself. Um, I guess a question I have, you said you'd keep us up to date like the dairy barn and, and other things that are very concerning to you. Uh, we might get into at least some conversations about uh, about uh, upkeep of, of things like that before they fall apart. I'm not sure it's a good plan to put in a bunch of money for a seven to 10 year uh, salvation of a building that really is going to be toast in at the end of the seven year period of time. But anyway, we'll have that conversation further. And I, I'm hoping that the state of Wyoming, it's been kind of a battle in the past. Um, we have two champions right here that, that, have come to bat with the legislature, with the appropriations uh, committee on the importance of this facility. And many of us know it is just a place that has built young people for years in a variety of ways, not just show animals, but thank you very much. Make sure the people that that are on uh, really involved with this, especially the board, the community leaders, let them know how thankful the Ag Committee is for that. Any further questions or comments? Okay, well, we're going to uh, go and uh, take a tour really quick. Um, and you got some uh, a map in your committee materials, folks. But before we do that, this is uh, the last meeting for several of our members. So uh, no pressure one way or the other. 
Um, so uh, before we take that tour, uh, Representative Blackburn is going to come on down and say a few words. And anybody who's uh, this is your last committee meeting in the legislature, uh, feel free to do something similar if you feel so inclined. But uh, yeah, Representative Blackburn, come on up. You're going to address us from the, from the table there. So yeah. You know, I, I've learned a lot from this ag. I've, I've been on here a few years, not very many, but uh, it's amazing the things that I have learned and I've learned a little bit from each of you. And I wanna thank all of you uh, for helping me through this few years on this ag committee, uh, as well as the staff. We have a superb staff. Uh, our staff is very helpful. Most of you are very helpful to one another as well as to myself. And uh, before I leave, I'd like to shake each one of your hands and ask those that are staying in the legislature to stay the course. And I know you'll do the right thing. Go you do whatever you want. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody? Okay. So I guess Clawson's next. So here. Okay. Then we'll get lost. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I'd like to uh, quote Senator Fred Emrick when he left the legislature free at last, free at last, free at last. <laughs> Aaron's predecessor was Dick Kennedy and his closing remarks when, when his chairman says, Dick, would you like to, Richard, he went by Richard, would you like to say a, a few words? And he said, I don't know why I should start now. <laughs> <laughs> and you had, to, you had to be around him to know just how true that was. Okay, but, uh, Senator Wasberger. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would like to thank the members of the committee. It's been a pleasure getting to know you all and work with you. I'd also like to thank the LSO staff for all their hard work and the incredible time that they put in over the years. And, and over the years, I've seen uh, people come and go, uh, but the legislature always had one thing in common, at least to me, was uh, the best interests of Wyoming at heart and to do what you think is best. And I just urge all of you to uh, continue what you're doing, which is work hard, uh, do the best that you can. It appears to uh, at least financially be a very good two years for Wyoming, uh, largely because of Campbell County coal, I will add. <laughs> but you, you enjoy the money that you get from my community. Anyway, uh, it has been an amazing, uh, 20 years in the legislature for me. And so um, I leave largely because of health reasons, uh, not because I uh, felt like I had to leave. It was just something that uh, wasn't in the books for me at the time that it was filing deadline time. So at any rate, my health is, is awesome. It's uh, as good as it's ever been. And so um, at that time, it just wasn't there. So good luck to all of you and um, go Pokes. Yeah, we'll just go down the line there. If anybody else, go. so Senator Costa, you're next if you'd like. So, yes. <laughs> oh. 
Well, uh, it's been a true pleasure for four years to be on the Ag Committee. It's one of my uh, upbringings and definitely a, a true passion. Uh, I have nothing but utmost respect for everybody and the work that they do. LSO has been just absolutely fabulous, and they're always a great group to work with, as well as uh, fun to be around and give a hard time to. Um, yeah, you know, uh, this has been an experience of a lifetime, and I can honestly say uh, the friendships I've had in it and uh, the people I've been able to work side by side with has been uh, a memory I'll never forget. Uh, it's time to move on to the next chapter of my life and whatever that is I'll be happy with and move forward but I uh, really have had a wonderful four years and I really appreciate it so I thank all of you for the time and the camaraderie Hey, Representative Worf, if you'd like to say anything, your turn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I really wasn't going to say anything. I I, uh, I know uh, it's been a short term. Uh, you know, I, I've enjoyed working okay. and getting to know you guys. Uh, most of you I knew from a prior life when I was on the other side of the curtain. And so... It was kind of fun to to get to co-mingle with you. And obviously I'm disappointed that I'm not moving on to the Senate. Uh, and, uh, you know, I don't believe in saying goodbye because I believe that life is eternal and we'll all see each other uh, one way or another. Uh, you know, I will darken the doorway again. I'm sure you guys will see me in Cheyenne and you'll probably wonder what the hell did we do? But uh, I have enjoyed it. Uh, you know, and it, it has been uh, fun. I I hope, uh, obviously, you can tell I get uh, very passionate about what I believe in. And I look around our, our world and our state, and, you know, I am concerned. Uh, I've seen the changes. And, you know, I, I do agree with what Senator Wasberger said. Uh, you know, it used to always be about what's what what can we do that makes Wyoming better? And I never seen the the divide. Uh, to me, there's there's not really a, a political divide anymore. It seems like the Democrats don't exist. Uh, the division that I see now is within the party, the Republican Party, and I don't like seeing that. Uh, I'll be honest, I liked it better when we had balance and we had both parties being represented because we could focus on the state better. I, I felt like that was more uh, the direction and where we all start with common, the commonality of party. Uh, sometimes it's like a family. The only thing you fight about is family disagreements. And, and that's what it's always been to me. At the, the session's always been like a big family reunion. And I do appreciate uh, my adversarial friendships that I've had, uh, you know, it's never been personal with me. And if you felt that way, I'm, I'm sorry, because I've never, ever tried to make anything personal. I've always tried to make it focused on the issues. And, and that's what I would urge is look for ways we can make Wyoming better, continue to fight the good fight. Uh, our nation needs Wyoming to be more in a leadership role. And I, I look at that as, as our duty and obligation as legislators in the state is to step that up so with that you guys i'm always long-winded so i'm gonna let us all go see the fair so i i do appreciate it we'll talk to you later
Okay, and Representative Fortner, your turn. Well, I'd like to echo everything Bob just said, uh, but I'd like to add to that as well. I couldn't have handpicked a better bunch of people to work with in Cheyenne than we've had in this committee and the House and the Senate as well. Uh, they've shown me uh, unwavered love for my, my boy and me as well. And uh, <clears throat> I guess my biggest takeaway is don't give our constitution away through amendments because we'll never get them back for our kids. Amendment A, that's gone too far, in my opinion. Thank you very much. Okay, with that, one last you know, final call for any questions, comments. Oh. Mr. Chairman, I just wanted to check directives to staff, and I believe yeah, that it's just the letter um, from you folks to management council to um, regard to let them know what y'all did and request funding and and um, approval. Right? Anything? Any other directives? Yeah, I think that's it. We'll have to uh, um, decide which uh, bills start in which chamber. We'll wait till after this weekend to uh, once we figure out a little bit more, know a little bit more about how things are going to work in the new legislature. But uh, yeah, well, I, I imagine the current chairman will at least do that work in consultation with whoever the new chairman may or may not be. And uh, yeah, we'll just go from there. So okay. I'll yeah. send, we'll send you a list of the bills so that you are able to figure out which house. Right. Which and, and also uh, the only other thing I'm thinking of is uh, uh, making sure that letter that we sent to DOI and uh, our congressional delegation is up on the uh, committee materials uh, for public view so yes mr chairman it's already up oh perfect Thanks. all right there you go thank you very much okay last call committee questions comments snide remarks good work everybody it's been an honor working with you and uh we've done some good work made some good progress for wyoming agriculture and uh, our water resources and you know thinking about you know the increased meat processing capacity, especially. So thank you, Director Miyamoto, uh, for that. I think we're up to 12 USDA plants now in Wyoming. And two years ago, that was zero. So that's something that was, you know, the past two years, this committee really helped with. Uh, yeah, I'm really proud of that. So keep up the good work, no matter where you go. It's been an honor working with all of you.